There hasn't been been a better time to collective actions to combat climate change. We are honored to welcome in our second session His Excellency Juan Carlos Varela Rodriguez, former President of the Republic of Panama, His Excellency Fahad Mohammed Al Hamadi, Acting Assistant Under Secretary of the Green Development and Climate Change Sector at the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment, and Sir Tim Smith, Executive Vice Chair and Co-Founder of Eden Project. Our moderator is Richard Dean, co-host of Breakfast Business Breakfast at Dubai Eye. Assalamu alaikum wa here. So let's jump straight into our discussion on collective actions to combat climate change. I'm going to ask our speakers to set the scene in a second. But first of all, uh, as a journalist, I'm going to start with a game, okay, a, a game show this morning. And the game is called, um, Who Said This? So I'm going to read you two quotes on climate change. Just shout out the answers. There are no prizes. But who said this on climate change? First of all, first of all, people are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? I should be in school. Who said that? Greta, yes, that was Greta Thunberg, Swedish schoolgirl speaking at the United Nations earlier on this year. Okay, the second and final question I have is this. Climate change is a hoax. I am not a great believer in man-made climate change. I don't want to give trillions and trillions of dollars. I don't want to lose millions and millions of jobs. I don't want to be put at a disadvantage. Who said that? <laughs> Donald Trump, President of the United States of America. So there are different views on uh, climate change. I have to say, our panelists today, I think, are probably, if I may speak on their behalf, probably more leaning towards the Greta camp rather than the Donald Trump camp, but I shall let them put it in their own words. Uh, first of all, uh, President Juan Carlos Varela of uh, Panama, president until just a, a few months ago after a five-year term. I'm going to ask you uh, to, to frame climate change in your terms and then maybe look at some of the collective actions that the world can do because that's the, the, the topic of this discussion, but then some specific things that Panama did under, under five years of your leadership. Thank you, Richard. Uh, first of all, good morning. I would like to thank the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Foundation for the invitation to this Knowledge Summit. It has been a great experience to be in Dubai, to be back in Dubai, to see this beautiful country and this beautiful city. And well, in my case in Panama, we pass a law uh, for us to be able to protect the rainforest is key because the Panama Canal function, functioning depends on, on, on water. Every trip that passes through the Panama Canal uses 50 million gallons of fresh water, and we pass close to 35 to 40 ships every day. And that's close to 7% of our economy. That, and if you see the things around, the Panama Canal is close to 20% of our economy that depends on that logistic platform that is the Panama Canal. So for Panama to protect the rainforest is key. So we pass a law to recover one million hectares of rainforest in the next 20 years with the support of civil society, NGOs, and also uh, the private sector. It's very important that everybody gets involved. Also in our case of Panama, 22% of our land is controlled by indigenous people. So to be able to support them so they protect the rainforest is key. So the government invested a lot of money in different communities to train them how to protect the rainforest. Also invested a lot of money and resources also to, to recover rainforests. And at the same time, we invested more than, the country is going to invest close to $10 billion in just 10 years to build a massive transportation system. Line one, line two, and line three of the metro. Uh, line one and line two are already finished and functioning with 40 kilometers, moving close to 500,000 people every day. And line three is gonna uh, be start building the next, uh, next months and it will be moving another 250,000 people. Our city, Panama City, has 1.5 million citizens, and to have a very efficient transportation system for them is key to be able to fight against climate change. And you did, it was in 2016, you were the person who signed the Paris Climate Accord yes, on behalf uh, of Panama. Yes, uh, a very difficult moment because of the Bataclan terrorist uh, attack. Just uh, 150 world leaders went to Paris to sign the agreement, but also to support France on this terrorist attack. It's a very uh, difficult moment for all of us because we visit the Bataclan area and we, we can feel the, the hate that, and what, what happened there. But at the same time, it was a strong answer by all world leaders 
to support a climate change agreement. Well, another country to have ratified the Paris Climate Accord is the United Arab Emirates, which brings me on to His Excellency Fahad al-Hamadi, the Acting Assistant Undersecretary for Green Development and Climate Change Sector at the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment for uh, the UAE. Again, Your Excellency, if I can ask you to frame uh, the climate change debate in your terms, or rather the terms of the UAE government, maybe tell us a little bit about what you think the collective actions we can be taking are, and then briefly outline a couple of the initiatives that the UAE has taken. Not all of them, because that would take a long time, but a couple of highlights of what the UAE is actually doing. Uh, thanks, uh, Richard. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very good morning to all of you, and I'm very glad to be part of this uh, panel uh, discussion. You know, Richard, whenever we I start to talk about the climate change, I, I started to get excited, and then I'm going to keep talking, talking, so you have to tell me when, when, when I need to, to stop. I think let's, let's start about the climate change, change itself as, as a problem. Where we are today, uh, I think, uh, Richard, if you read the newspaper or attend any international platform, the discussion around the climate change done in a global level, in a global scale, and, and it is a problem. Why? Because we don't live in a global scale. We live in UAE scale. The question is how I will be impacted from climate change. We keep hearing the sea level rise, the increase of the temperature on a global scale, but the impact of the climate change from a region to a region or country to a country is going to be different, where we need to have a better understanding how the impact will be in this particular region, especially in UAE, as we are living in a very drought region with a high temperature uh, uh, climate. So what we have done in, in UAE in, in 2016, the establishment of Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. So now we have allocated ministry to look after the file of climate change. And one important task, as a first task was given to us, is we need to see where do we locate it at from the climate change in UAE. We need to have a very clear roadmap what are the conditions today, and where do we want to be, and how do we look like in that year? So we develop a national climate change plan in 2050. It's a roadmap for UAE, where it has focused on a couple of priorities. One of them, how we manage our greenhouse gases while we are sustaining our economy, where with the, the desertification of our economy. Similarly, how to become more climate resilient. I mean, the temperature is increasing, and we have noticed that. Like this summer in Mizera, western region of Abu Dhabi, the temperature has reached 52 degrees, while if you compare it to Paris, for example, this summer it has reached 40 degrees Celsius. It was the first time in their history. But for us, we are away ahead comparing to, to the condition in, 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 in Paris or France, where we look at self, we are living the future for other countries in terms of the, of the, of the temperature. The other element in, of the plan is how we can engage the private sector on the sustainable development of the country, because you cannot rely only on to, to the government. So we, we have developed the plan, so we have very clear priorities. The UAE is very well progressing in terms of mitigation, which is the cause of the, of the climate issues of the greenhouse gases, but it's very important to have a balance equation with adaptation program. So uh, through the annual government meeting in the first session, we decided to launch a program, it's called UAE National Adaptation Program, where we've been monitoring the climate or the weather condition trends for the past 30, 40 years, and we have identified four key sectors. One of them, energy, infrastructure, health, and environment. So we put the scenarios of the climate in UAE and how that will be impacting the infrastructure. We noticed that there will be an increase on the maintenance cost, cost of the infrastructure. We, we are expect, expecting more rain is happening during May, June, where you have summertime, where the temperature is very hot. So when you have that quick cooling happening in the road, next day, the water is dry, and then you see the cracks on the roads happening in, in different way of location. Similarly, we are looking with the Ministry of Infrastructure to study the road specifications. Uh, maybe you can check it even in YouTube. There are some countries in the world, like in India and some part of uh, in Kuwait, where the roads started to be melt. So the question, if we are having 52 degree climate here, we, which we have something achieved. So the question is what the reaction from the infrastructure going to be if we reach 53, 54. This is like when you boil the water, you see no reaction from the water unless you reach the 100 degree and then the boiling is happening. This is the similar that we want to adapt it in the infrastructure and health. Like today, there is an ongoing meeting happening with the Ministry of Health. We are looking forward to develop an alert system if there is 
an alert regarding the dust or sandstorm. So how uh, the people who are very sensitive with respiratory diseases, in a way they can get an alert to avoid an outdoor activity, so you reduce the number of, of admission. These are some of examples of what we, we are doing today in, in UAE in terms of responding to the, to the climate change. Well, there's a couple of interesting government public sector perspectives. Let's get a private sector perspective now. So Tim Smith is Executive Vice Chair and co-founder of the Eden Project in the United States. Kingdom. If you haven't seen the Eden Project, it was opened nearly 20 years ago. In, in my crude journalistic terms, I would describe it as a large eco-tourism project. It's about the size of 14 football pitches, these huge glass domes. There's a, a rainforest and so much more inside. It gets at least a, a million visitors a year and is estimated to have contributed a billion pounds to the economy of Cornwall, the part of England where it is uh, located. So Tim, uh, great to have you here. I'm going to ask you the same question that I, I put to these gentlemen, which is just frame climate change in your terms, uh, the problem, some of the, the solutions, and again, a couple of examples just to whet our appetite of what you and your team have been doing. Well, uh, thank you. Um, we are also privileged to be building uh, here in Dubai, we're working uh, at Expo 2020 on the sustainability pavilion with Grimshaw, who also built the Eden Project in Cornwall. Um, I'll start by being quite elliptical. The history of this period of humankind, when it's written in a hundred years, will probably be the history of weak, middle-aged men who were not brave enough to realize the difference between leadership and a popularity contest. When you're a parent, you do not let your children do everything. You have some sense about what is necessary for their upbringing. We have created a culture where we think we have to do what is likable, what is what the consumer wants. What's going on? Where does this word responsibility come in? Where does the notion that we are actually so smart as a species, we call ourselves homo sapiens sapiens, I think it's ridiculous. A lot of this debate is ridiculous. And in a sense, it needs to get worse because it reminds me in Britain of the banking crisis of 2008. I have many friends who are bankers. And what is amazing is over the last eight, nine years, every one of those bankers who did not see it coming when it came has now rewritten history to tell me how they knew it was coming. They saw it was coming because we can't bear that the world actually changes through shocks. We are going to have some terrible shocks. And most conferences like this refuse to accept that the great changes in humankind come through shocks. We need to be anticipating the sudden realization that fossil fuel reserves are suddenly not worth very much. And the fact that 23% of the world's pension funds are dependent on the returns from it. For example, so what's going to happen to the first guys who sell their shares? They're going to be really rich. And then after that, all the pensioners around the world will have not a lot. I actually think that what is required is a new story about humans. And we need to realize something that I realized three years ago. I climbed the tallest tree in the world, the biggest tree in the world, in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And when I got to the top of this tree, but well, not quite the top, I, I was close to the top, I was holding this tree, realizing it was four and a half thousand years old. That tree had lived through, to my knowledge, and your knowledge is probably better than mine, but to my knowledge, 37 different civilizations had started, reached their peak, and collapsed. What is frightening, if you look around this room, each one of those civilizations would have had people like us in it. We were the establishment. We were the smart guys and girls. And we screwed it up every time we screwed it up. So when is the point going to come when now, this is a real existential crisis, perhaps not this week, perhaps not five years. Maybe it's actually 50 years. But within the lifetime of many of the younger people in this audience. And I think a completely different approach has got to be taken. If you are, a gov if you are in charge of a government, I think the time for thinking that popular choice is going to get you the answers you need is over. 
I think we have got to recognise that governance, strong leadership, will not be unpopular with the people. Anybody who's ever run a company knows that in a company where the people who are working there know there are too many people and the company is suffering, they do not respect the boss for not firing people. They feel scared that the whole place is out of control. And I think the world is scared that the leadership of the world is out of control because they don't know how to make the decisions that will make them disliked. Well, as luck would have it, we have a president here to, to respond to some of those comments. You have you've run for office, you've, you've had your victories, of course, you were president for five years, you've also had defeats. What do you make of Tim's comments there about, about leadership and taking unpopular decisions? Well, listening to the former president of Iceland yesterday, a great opening speech for this Knowledge Summit, I was very impacted by that because he mentioned that it was the Chinese leaders that went to Iceland and started investing in geothermal energy and how that has been able to solve Iceland and other countries' uh, energy problem with clean energy. So really, it's, this, 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 this is the kind of leadership that I want to see. Leaders going out of their boundaries and working with other countries. And I would love to see you know, the United States and China working together in Latin America. That, I would say for climate change, for security, fighting against organized crime. So I think that's a big challenge. To see leaders thinking about six billion people, just one planet, because at the end, when I, I remember the, when the tsunami hit Japan some years ago, all the capacities, all the money that we invest in arms, in weapons, in wars, if we, some days we will need that to protect against nature, to protect against storms. So just one day, one storm hit the, the, the Bahamas last month, two months ago, and destroyed a couple of islands. It was a disaster. So I think that the world leaders must start thinking about six billion people, one planet. 193 countries, that's the UN, that's this kind of summit. They shouldn't be thinking just about their country. And in, in my case, just in, in Panama, uh, I, I would love to see world leaders working together in Latin America, helping us face the different challenges that, that affect our people. That's the kind of political leadership that we need. In, in specifically in Panama, we need, imagine a country of just 4 million people, and we need to build 30,000 to 40,000 new homes every year. How we build those homes? how we plan the cities, how we plan the future of our cities. Uh, the president of uh, Iceland, a great speech yesterday, to be honest, I was very impressed with it. He said that in the next 10 years to, or 20 years, 70% of the population will be living in cities, urban areas, not rural areas. How we build the cities, how we design the cities. In our case in Panama, we passed some regulation that a home can have the solar panel and they can even sell the energy back to the grid if they don't use the energy. We studied that for many months, but it was a very specific solution. Probably there will be just 1,000 homes today solving their energy problem with a solar panel. But let's think that in the future, 100% of the new homes that we build are built uh, with a solar panel included, that they can produce energy for themselves and also provide energy for the grid when they don't use it. Also, I saw an Italian architect giving a speech at this knowledge summit, and he said that we must go from horizontal to vertical. When you go to China, that's the way they're building the new cities. And that's the way it should be, because it's more efficient. Imagine all the money that Agora must invest. In, our, in the case of Panama, our city is 120 kilometers long. So because we keep, people want to have their own home, they don't want to go vertical. So we have to convince that they have to live vertical, because it's more efficient. Energy, waste, everything is, is, is better treated. So I would say that the debate of the future should be about finding solutions to the problems that affect the people, no matter what country you're the leader of. Well, to Tim's point about this room being the elite or the establishment, let's have a quick show of hands here. How many people here live vertically, live in an apartment rather than a single house? How many people live in an apartment vertically? Okay, that's at about, what, a, a quarter maybe? As a, as a, as a, as a rough note. Uh, Farhad al-Hamadi, the UAE has shown leadership in terms of tackling climate change, it has stated that yes, it is a problem. Um, and I was, I was reading from one of the many documents that the UAE has produced, uh, and if I can just quote from that, the, is it the, there's Vision 2021, there's also the 2050 targets to have 50% of energy from clean sources by 2050. Uh, and, and I know that the UAE has said, it's not just about bold statements, you have to have KPIs key performance indicators. So my question is this, what do you say 
to cynics and skeptics who dismiss any kind of initiative towards climate change from an economy like the UAE or Saudi Arabia that has such energy reserves, or indeed a company like a, a BP or an Exxon saying, how can you claim to be part of the solution when clearly as, as a carbon-based economy, you're part of the problem? What do you say to, to those people? Yeah, I mean, uh, here in UAE, our leadership is steering our economy toward the future beyond the oil. And we look at the climate change is not a threat. It's come, it brings an opportunities with it. So this is why we are diversifying our economy. Today, when you look to the overall GDP in UAE, 30% is coming from the oil and gas uh, sectors. While it's, we are targeting, as we are moving toward the 2050, we will be less reliable on oil and gas and producing these uh, a, new, a new sector. His Highness is Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, during one of the World Government Summit, he made a statement that we want to celebrate the last barrel of oil we are exporting from UAE. Given an indication, we shall not really depend on the oil for our economy. But there are other sectors that we, we really need to explore and work on it. When it comes to the UAE vision 2021 or 2050, you know, many governments had similar visions, but they have failed to achieve it. For a reason why they haven't really had that regular review in terms of how they are progressing in their targets or a plan till 21 or 2050. UAE, when we set the vision, these KPI cascaded down to the federal level where it's becoming as part of their individual KPI and in a way it's getting reviewed every year and see how we are progressing. Like one, one of the initiatives that the UAE government took in order to expedite the process of achieving these targets, we came with the annual government meeting where the government entities from the federal met together with the local entities and come with a certain initiative to expedite the process of achieving these uh, challenges that up the color. Now, when we speak about expertisms and, and, and companies like oil and gas, we have to be quite realistic. Oils now embedded in every product we are using today. Like, for example, when I look at this mic, it's produced from polyethylene, which is a down product from oil and gas products. So the question of, of the climate change is remain with the emissions and how we can improve the efficiency, the technologies. But it seems like the downstream product of the oil and gas is going to continue becoming because plastic is also considered as one of the downstream of the gas, which is from the oil itself. And you can see it everywhere in the shelf of the supermarket. It's it really advanced the technology of packaging. But the question is with the consumer. So believing the climate change or not, it's about witnessing the change. Have we witnessed the change in this region? We have witnessed it. We have reached 52 degrees. And we don't know how the future is going to look like. We are as a human, we can speak on our behalf of ourselves and how we are being impacted. So what about the biodiversity, the marine life, how they can speak can they come and talk to us that you have disposed our environment in a way? What can you do for us? This is what we, we really do. We, we need uh, to look at it. So the changes is, is, is happening. We, we are witnessing. Nobody can admit or desire that it's not happening. But the action is, which is something that we really need to focus on. Well, you, you used to work in the petrochemicals industry, didn't you? You worked at Barouge, yes. I think, before your, your government career. It's a big petrochemicals company here in the UAE and in, in Abu Dhabi. Also on your CV, I was noticing, and this is interesting, you are a board member of the Federal Authority of Nuclear Regulation. That's correct, yeah. So to what extent, and Tim, I'm keen to get your thoughts on this in a second as well, and also Juan Carlos, to what extent can we consider nuclear fuel to be part of the solution, to be a genuinely, quote, unquote, clean energy source? Now, when, when, when you look, there are challenges with the nuclear, when we look to the international incidents happening globally. But today for UAE, we all been, always consider the safeties of the nuclear before introducing the project. And we take the learning from, from Fukushima and recent events from Chernobyl. But for UAE, if, if you look at the energy consumption, why we in UAE, we are uh, very high per capita when it comes to the emissions. Sometimes we've been ranked one of the worst countries per capita. But they don't go behind the stories. Why, why UAE is high? 70% of our energy productions go for cooling and water desalinations. Imagine if we have a very nice climate weather like Europe, and you can give me water like Niagara Falls, 
I would get rid of, of 70% of our energy production. But today, with the 51 degree temperature or 45, you cannot survive providing a cooling system to the people. So now everyone in this country has been access to energy and cooling because without cooling, you cannot survive. But this is how we are adapting the environment in these regions. This is why the, the emission per capita is high. Now, the combination of energy, we need to look after number of combination. We cannot only rely on solar. Yes, we are located in a region exposed with high sun radiations, but, but we are not also uh, having an access to other natural resources like wind, turbine, or geothermal, because in other countries, you can have that combination. Well, solar, and I know, Tim, you're, you're exploring for geothermal, aren't you? Essentially in your own backyard. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. And also your thoughts on, on nuclear. Part of the, the solution or the problem? <clears throat> the true situation with nuclear globally is that the environmental movement missed a trick. It never asked the right question. By being against nuclear, it enabled uh, the nuclear industry to continuously say to ministers, we can turn the lights off if you like, which is always a tremendous threat. The question should have been, and I spoke to the boss of EDF about this and he laughed, he said the question should have been, why are you using that type of nuclear? What actually happened was the, the, the nuclear industry, obviously when it began, was seeking to make plutonium as part of a war effort. And that, te that technology meant that we did not explore, for example, thorium as a source, except in submarines. Um, so I'm not anti-nuclear per se as an environmentalist. I'm not. I think that's a crazy thing to be. I just think that the cost, the cost of nuclear is astonishing because it is so heavily subsidized. The strike price that governments have to pay per unit for 25 years the fact that the government always ensures, I don't know if it's the same in your country, but certainly in Britain, the government ensures nuclear where it doesn't ensure anything else. And the cleanup is also seems to be down to us, the citizen. The, thing, the reason we're going for geothermal is that one of the things that I think is going to happen with the decline in uh, extraction of fossil fuels is that the technology for that extraction is going to become available for uh, 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 drilling for geothermal. And geothermal, the reason we are, we are going for geothermal is A, it's quite near the surface for us, uh, but it's actually the last piece of the jigsaw for renewables because the issue for, for renewables has always been there's been no baseload, which means that when the sun isn't shining and when the uh, wind isn't blowing, you have this hiatus, which means that actually, despite having renewables, you haven't got uh, a, a way of doing without coal or gas or oil. Um, so we're going for geothermal, and I think the, the, the scientific frater uh, fraternity, which mostly it is a fraternity, have actually done a great disservice to that technology, because for us, four kilometers down, we're hitting 240 degrees C, right? And we can produce electricity, we will be producing electricity and hot water off that. You could do that all over the world. The issue is the price of going deeper. In some parts of the world, you need to go deeper. But I can tell you, I can go into any classroom anywhere on this planet, and I can look at a classroom. Mm -hmm. cool. Fine. The world's hot. Seems like a good place to go. We can actually do this thing. And they'll go, yeah. I wouldn't go nuclear. Uh, I'm a man of faith. I think Mother Nature will give us what we need. It's a way of finding it. Uh, in, in, in the case of Panama, we have a new eolic park uh, in the past. It was built uh, six years ago. It was concluded during my presidency. And it was like a $400 million investment. And it provides 20% of the energy that the country needs during the weekends. Just this eolic park. The day I won the election, it sent a strong message to the investors. And just one investor, when he saw me, Winning the elections, he called the, 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 the company to expand the Eolic Park to 400 mega. And today it's providing close to 20% of the energy during five months. So I, I will go Eolic, I will go solar, I will go clean energy. And in, in also in Panama, in the case of Panama, we expanded the Panama Canal. So there's a lot of LNG going from the United States to Asia, uh, going to crossing, cr crossing to the Panama Canal now, to China, to Japan, to Korea. So I will go a oh, different alternative, non nuclear. I mean, let's talk about the Panama Canal for a second. Is it 6% of world trade every day yep. goes through the Panama Canal is one of the statistics that, that I read. 
This is a headline from the Financial Times from three or four months ago. And this is the headline. Climate change poses a new threat to the Panama yes. Canal. It says a severe El Nino weather phenomenon struck. Uh, the canal had to impose cargo restrictions. This was under your time as, as president to cope with what turned into the worst drought in Panama's 115 year history or the canal's 115 year history. So you touched on the canal earlier, but explain in simple terms why climate change is a clear and present danger for that canal. Yeah, because that's the main challenge of, of, of my country for the next years is because the lakes that support the function of the Panama Canal is, are the same lakes that provide drinking water to the two most important Panamanian cities, to 60 to 70% of our population. So the same lakes that retain fresh water from the rain and from the rivers, they use 50 million gallons of water for each ship. So we need the rainfall. If we don't have the rainfall, then we have draft restrictions. That the so ship the canal would run dry? Yeah, if, if we don't have the rain, we, we need to, we need to, uh, we have to look for alternative. The salinization is one alternative, but it will be too expensive. So the idea will be to find in alternative sources and then taking that water from other lakes to the lakes uh, that support the Panama Canal functioning today. The, I, I installed a commission with the Panama Canal Authority, which is an autonomous authority in Panama, with, with all the different government agencies, and they, they've been conducting different studies. And I think we will be ready. Because to be able to, to create new lakes, you have to move the population. That, that takes a lot of time. Now with social media, you see what's going on in Latin America. Social media is really becoming a threat to different political system in our region, because there's different situations going on in Chile, in Bolivia, Nicaragua, as, as I speak today. So we have to be very careful. If we're going to build a new reservoir or a new lake and we have to move people from where they've been living for many years, it's going to be a big challenge. It will take a lot of time and effort from the leaders to be able to achieve that. So I will support the solution of bringing water from what is called the Bayano Lake, a huge lake that is like 80 kilometers from the Gatun uh, Lake that supports the Panama Canal functioning. And I think that's the best solution to, to, to take water from one lake to the other lakes, the way the Chinese are doing it. And in that way, we will be able to solve that problem because there's enough water in these other lakes that can support the actual lakes that that that, that support the Panama Canal functioning. And indeed, the, the FT quotes someone described as a Panamanian environmental activist, a gentleman by the name of Felix Solis, who says that the government must take care not to construct new lakes at the expense of the forests because that would defeat the purpose. Yeah, it will be a big challenge to do it that way. It will be a big challenge. I think the best way is to bring water from the Bayano Lake that is already exists, and it was built for a hydropower station. So I, that, that's the best solution, and I think the country will start building that in the next years. I've got loads more questions, but I'm happy to take some questions from the audience. We do have some microphones. We've got a bit of time left. I'm not going to leave Q&A to the end, so if you have a question or a comment, who's got the first question for our panelists today? Happy to take that question. Well, while you think about those questions, uh, Fahad Al-Hamadi, if I can turn to you, and we've raised the issue of water a few times now, and, and you mentioned it as well. What's the next generation of water desalination or water creation here in the UAE? I know, for example, uh, powering the plants by, by solar is one issue that, that Abu Dhabi is looking at. A contract was issued, I think, just about two weeks ago, a billion dollar contract on that level. The other issue is not just creating the water, it's what do you do with the salt and the saline or the brine as it's sometimes known? Because at the moment that has to be pumped back out into the Arabian Gulf, which is a relatively small waterway. I know this is something that you and your colleagues take seriously. Yeah, I think to take the first part of, of the questions is when we look at the water resources, this is a global issue. And the technology is not really advancing, advancing fast, especially when it's come to the uh, desalination from, from the Gulf. UAE is, is working in a number of projects. One of it, uh, depending how the solar can power desalination unit with Masdar. There are three pilot projects happening in, in, in Abu Dhabi. But the, the, the other side, or the other fact, uh, Richard, when we talk about uh, water desalination and, and salinity of the GCC, which being in, notice being increased, due to the large number of the desalination units happening from the neighboring country. We speak about more than 2,000 desalination units from small, medium, large scale. They are pumping from, from the Gulf and discharging the salty water back to the, to, to, to the Gulf, which increases the salinity. And then when you look to the Gulf cycle, to have one full cycle taking not less than 
10 years. So, so there is a challenge in face in this region. We are at the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. As you know, during summer, we have high humidities, and the humidity can go up to 80, 90 percent. So there is a lot of water resources available in the air. So the question is, how can we develop a technology of extracting water from the air itself rather than depending heavily on the installation? We have done a number of projects. We, we see it, it's visible, but it requires further study around, uh, around uh, this area. Now, the desalination is an issue. There is no other alternative resources. Today, we, we, there is water taken from underground due to the large number of, of of, of farm available in UAE, but still that has also put stress on the underground water. So UAE is looking for different uh, approach by treating the wastewater that can be diverted back to the farmer rather than consuming the underground uh, water. But again, I think when we look to the GCC region here, UAE alone cannot work, but all the entire countries where we look after the downstream of the water production in terms of consumption, how we are consuming our water. Today, I think there is a high consumption is happening with the wastewater that has to be brought to the attention of the consumer and how we can work together of looking at the available solution in order to reduce the consumption either in the industry or the household. I, I'm keen now to, to move away from the, the, the very high profile titles that all our panelist, uh, panelists have. We have a president, we have a, uh, His Excellency from the ministry, we have one of the world's leading environmentalists, but you all do different things as well. And Tim, if I can turn to you, you started life as a musician, didn't you? Um, and you came to, to this world completely by accident. I've, I've heard some of your other interviews, but if you, could, if you could tell us that story about how you ended up in, in a remote part of England called Cornwall. Okay, I was actually an archeologist at the University of Durham. And when I was at Durham, I was very poor and I could play the piano. So I decided to start a rock band so that I could earn some money at university. And when I left university, I was still poor, and I thought, I shall go to London, where the roads are paved with gold. So I went to London and discovered that on any particular day of the week, there were 30,000 musicians better than me. <laughs> um, but anyway, one thing led to another, and I played football on Clapham Common in London, and I kicked a man very hard, and he fell screaming to the floor. It turned out that he was the main sound engineer at the world famous Abbey Road Studios. So I said, hello. <laughs> and he let me use the studio and we had some hit records and blah, 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 blah. Then one day I found myself in the back of a limousine in Paris having written the best selling record in French history up until that point. And I've never been so unhappy in my life. I was just miserable. It's really weird when you achieve what you think you want you then get it and you realize it means nothing to you. So I decided I would lead my life from that moment on. I was 37 years old in chaos. I went on holiday, it rained. I went into an estate agent to shelter. I saw a house for sale, I bought it. I then didn't know what I was going to do and a man turned up with a Land Rover and a trailer and he said, I've got a pig that needs a home. I said, I don't know how to look after pigs. He said, you will. And he gave me a pig and the pig lived in my garage and the pig and I became very friendly. <laughs> and I suddenly realized he was lonely. I won't tell you how I knew that. Um, <laughs> but I then, he was called Horace and I then found him a mate called Doris and they then had babies. And I then realized that my whole mission in life was to start a rare breed park for rare farm animals. Farm animals. So I went to find some land. I went to, to some land that was perfect and I found who owned it. I went to see the man who owned it, and he gave me a very hot cup of coffee, and my lips are very sensitive. So when he told me I couldn't have the land, I still was standing there with the coffee. And he said, what did you used to do? And I said, I used to be an archeologist. And he then uttered words I've never heard before or since. I have need of an archeologist. And he told me that right next to where we were sitting, there was an estate that had been lost since 1915, because most of the gardeners who were there um, had died in the First World War. And I cut my way through there the next day with him. And that evening, I shook his hand and I said, I want to lease this estate and I'm going to kiss it back to life. The TV came, they filmed it, it became very famous. It's now the most visited uh, garden of its kind in Britain. And while I was doing that, I thought, I've realized something really interesting. I didn't use any Latin. And suddenly, people who don't normally go to gardens started to come. And people started to get married there and people fell in love, and people got buried while well, their ashes were scattered there. 
And I realized that plants are really cool, but they can't sing and they can't dance. So maybe if I could tell their story, I could do something that was cool for them. So I went to find a derelict clay pit, and I persuaded a whole bunch of people to put up 144 million pounds in the middle of nowhere. Everybody said it was going to be a disaster. I knew it wouldn't be. And you know how I knew that? Because if you love something, really love something, there will be millions and millions of people who feel the same. So today we've had 21 million people go through uh, the Eden Project and we're building 17 others, all different, all over the world, but they're all completely different. Why? Because people want something different. The word we use at this conference, right? Sustainability. My friend Bill McDonough, who's possibly one of the world's greatest architects, he said, if I was to look at you and say your relationship with your best friend or your wife or partner was sustainable, how excited are you? <laughs> what a dull thing to be sustainable. Our lives are to be beautiful and joyful, and we should actually be trying to do that. And then other people will think we've got a great story to tell. So that's how I came to do this. <laughs> and there's one other, it's an incredible story. And there's one bit that, that I love from the story, because you did make some money in the music business. Um, but after buying this house and, and leasing the forest, you were, to use your words, skint. Yes. And you needed a tractor. And, and, and I mean, you told the Financial Times a while ago where you got the 700 quid from for the tractor, <laughs> which was from a song you'd written. It was, well, imagine you are going to a dentist, and in that dentist there is a magazine to be read because the next patient hasn't finished, the first patient hasn't finished, and it's a copy of The Stage magazine for television and theatre. I open it up at random, and there's this picture of a very famous English footballer from the years gone by called Jackie Charlton, who was going to do a TV show called Go Fishing, and... 15 years before, I had written a joke song for a friend on a banjo called Go Fishing. And I thought, maybe I was meant to read this. So I found the tape and I posted it to the television company. And they said, this is exactly what we're looking for. And it actually made me enough money to not go broke. So there is a God. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Juan Carlos, as well as, as running countries, your family business in Panama is in the beverage industry. You're a, a significant producer of various beverages. And obviously, you're in agriculture, you're in food processing and manufacturing, and there's an environmental impact for that. And, and in well, not your day job, but your sideline, helping to run this business, you, you've made a few changes, haven't you? Yes. Uh, um, my family business is the beverage business. We have two arcane fields. And once uh, I have a good story, once I was the manager of uh, like 30, 25, 30 years ago of the company. And I was wa walking to the sugar cane fields. We used to burn the sugar cane fields. And I saw the workers, you know, ashes on their faces. They didn't have the best equipment. They were taken to their job places with not, the, not by bosses, walking. And it was very, and then I had a big argument with the engineers that why we're doing this this way. This is not the way. Walking through, this, through the land, very, very warm. Say, let's change it, let's stop burning the sugarcane fields. No, that's gonna cost a lot of money. We have to, to, to invest a lot of money. This, it's a lot easier for them to, to, to burn the sugarcane fields. So I said, this is not the right thing to do. So we stopped, I decided to stop it. And with the money that we save from not burning the sugarcane fields, we were able to raise the salaries, pay social security, buy buses, increase, uh, all, increase all the capacities, uh, better support for them, for their families. We save clo close to, close to a million dollars by stopping burning the sugarcane fields. And today in Latin America, many sugarcane fields are still being burned. It's a big mistake because even sometimes the easiest way to do things is not the best in the long term. So that was a very personal experience for me when I was working for the family business uh, some years ago. I was educated by the Jesuits, and I always say that in life, what year you were born define your future. And what you were doing when you were between 14 and 18 years old, because that's the first time where you take your own decisions. So I was born in 1963, and in 1977, the Panama Canal treaties were signed between General Torrijos and former President Jimmy Carter. And Carter put pressure to all Latin American leaders to open their country to democracy. Free President Carter did a lot of good things for Latin America because he established, he supported democracy. And that year also there were many conflicts, civil wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, big conflict between, the, it was the Colera, the Russia, United States, uh, fighting in the region, 
And when I was a kid, uh, 14 years old, I would wake up every day and see the newspaper, young, young kids like me fighting civil wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador. So that's how I took the decision that I will go to public life someday and I will cross from private to public life and just uh, try to be a peacemaker and also educated by the Jesuits. Uh, they, they were very tough on us about social justice, about uh, you know, distributing wealth to the people and interfaith dialogue. We saw the visit of Pope Francis to, to the Emirates uh, two months ago just to promote interfaith dialogue and to fight against terrorists, to tear them together. So, I mean, my life has been impacted by, by the year that I was born, by the country, and the moment that I, that, that I was when I was like between 14 and 18 years old. So I left the family business uh, close to 15 years ago. I moved to, from private to public life, and I will stay in, in, in public life. I visited the satari camps in Jordan when, when you see 80,000 Syrian refugees and when you go to that place and you see what's going on there, you want to go back. You feel that the public life is a call. And once you, you can adapt your, your vocation to your profession is when you find happiness in life. And well, Fahad Al Hamadi, clearly public life and public service is what you, you do now. We talked briefly about your um, side hustle, can we call it, helping to run the, the country's nuclear operations. Uh, but I want to ask you about about something from your childhood. And it's a conversation that we all had in the green room backstage. And you think one of the problems is, is the way children spend their, their free time. So tell us about growing up here in, in Abu Dhabi. Okay, I can share something, but I'm not sure I will be good to share it. But something is happening yesterday, for example, with the weather that we are experiencing today. First time in my life, you see my 12 years old son, spent almost three hours in his PC, searching, reading about the weather forecast. Till then he's looking at the weather forecast, Saudi Arabia, UAE, how it's gonna look like. 9.30 p.m. he said, Dad, there is no school tomorrow. <laughs> this is what I came out of my study. I think, Richard, if I go back 30 years ago, during my childhood, not very far from, from now, I remember waking for us when my dad take us to do fishing, we enjoy playing with the environment. Sometimes later he take us to the farm where we do a plantation. If I compare the time, our childhood, with my son period, you see them, they are more attached to their iPad computer. They are not really well connected to the environment. And I'm sure, I guarantee that everyone experienced the same. So during weekend, dad, I want my iPad. I want to go to the movie, to the cinema, to the mall. How many often? We take them to, to the nature, to, to go to Ras Al Khor, to see the flamingo, or to go to Al Marmoum area. I think we have an issue. Do you think that this generation is going to care more about the environment in the future than us? I think we lived in the transition, the change happened to the environment. But for them, maybe they do it in school, they read it, but they haven't yet touched it or exposed it in their life. So I think here, my, my, my message to everyone, we need to spare some time with our kids and let them play with the environment because this is the way how they will feel and sense how important it is. Maybe this weekend we should not take them to uh, Dubai Mall, sorry, Amar, sorry, someone from Al Futim, <laughs> but we should take them to Al Marmoum area or to the Ras Al Khor, just let them enjoy uh, how beauty the nature it is. If they will be attached to the computer, iPad, yeah. I'm really scared of the future. And you jumped on that in the green room, didn't you, Tim, when, when Farhad started telling, telling that story? But how, how okay, I, uh, yes, I think we all agree. I've got a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. How do we do it? So it's fun for them rather than boring dad wants us to go to the, the farm. Hey, uh, I don't have all the answers, I tell you. But one thing which is crazy is that I'm sure it's the same here and in Panama, uh, in Britain, in France, Holland. We want to inflict on our children the education we had ourselves. We're not going to make it better for them. They're going to have to put up with what we've had. And so in Britain, you can actually have a, an education system where you, you do your maths, your history, a bit of geography. If you were into sciences, you do a bit of sciences. It's crazy. What, what we were talking about in the green room was what we've, I don't know whether you feel the same, we've actually infantilized the world. We've turned everybody into children. There are no rites of passage anymore. 
because people don't understand that there is a change. There is a change where you become somebody who knows how to take responsibility. And people don't know how to do that anymore. We understand a lot about rights, but very little about responsibilities. And I actually believe, if I was king, um, I would have an education system in which, right at the heart of it, every single child had to learn to grow the food that they were going to eat, would then have to learn how to cook it, because that way you would learn the respect for not being wasteful. Anybody who knows how to cook, actually does cook, hates waste. And lastly, I would make it law that every child from three or five, whatever the suitable age is, until you leave university, if you go to university, must, must learn natural history. Because I cannot believe that the world would be in the state it is in now if we had all learnt natural history, because we would understand the cycles of life and we wouldn't want to make it broken, would we? Would we? No. No, but, but, we wouldn't, because we're all pretty nice people, I think. I think. But Fahad, you, again, you were saying, you know, at, at the risk of romanticising the past too much, but your grandmother, when she was cooking for you, would never waste any food. This is what I learned from her, you know, because she always tell me during the 70s, 60s, they felt the shortage of food here. It was about almost a starvation. It was, for them, food waste is not exist in their definitions. So whatever left over from lunch, they will keep it to the dinner. Today, when she's with us in the dining, when she see my son or the other kids, no, I don't want that. I want something else from outside. She saw that the, 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 the amount of waste of food is there. And it is really, today, if you go to any restaurant, put in your mind, 60% of your bill is covering the waste food because it's true, 70 of the food served on the table is go to the garbage. The question is, those generations, they haven't really lived the time of my grandmother where they lived the time that the food it was key issues for them. It is something that... Maybe you spend a day without either having a lunch or a dinner. Sometimes they've been living for a week just eating dates. But now with the God blessing and what we have resources, but we have also to, to take care of this. Otherwise, you don't know the life cycle. It's going and coming. So this is my, my grandmother. Sometimes you see the tear on her eye because during that time, she, they couldn't find this food. But now it's with availability, you see the amount of waste is there. This is why we need to educate them. We need to tell them the stories of how our grand-grandfathers survive in this environment and how they can learn from them. If you don't have a past, you don't have to, you don't have a future to care of. And Juan Carlos, I'm sure similar stories from when you were growing up. You said you were born in the, in the 60s. That's correct, 63. So in terms of, of agriculture now, and it brings us on to the issue of agriculture and how we make it, more sustainable because it is responsible for what was the stat you used Tim 40 it's, di it's directly responsible for 42 percent of emissions directly and indirectly globally um so we, we need to look at it there's a big movement now that we should all be eating less meat and more vegetarian food what's happening in Panama in terms of agriculture and, and the food supply chain I will say that it, the, the protein consumption is moving more to other products like chicken and other products that can be produced in less in, in smaller areas. Uh, so we are, uh, the, the, it's changing a lot. We're looking for more efficiency, irrigation, more technology, supporting the, the, the farmers with more resources so they can be more efficient the way they produce. So the government has to get involved and, and also the private sector must play a, a very important role in helping them, the, the small farmers, so they can organize themselves and be able to be more productive and more efficient and more profitable too. But uh, in, in, in our case, we, we, we import some, uh, a lot of food also from other countries, but we have a very stable uh, agricultural system, the cattle, the rice, uh, the sugar, and some different products that Panama uh, produces what it consumes. And, and certainly uh, Fahad al-Hamadi here in the UAE, but also in the Gulf in Saudi Arabia, famously in the, in the 80s and 90s, there were some fairly disastrous attempts to encourage agriculture here and, and wheat production, well-intentioned, particularly in Saudi Arabia, but the, the consumption of water was so big that it, the, the, the costs far outweighed the benefits. Now we're seeing in the UAE a move towards food production, but very, very water-efficient 
food production. And you were observing earlier the irony that one of the companies that's really pushing sustainable agriculture in the UAE is an airline, Emirates, normally demonized whenever we're talking about climate change. We also have, um, and if you don't live in the UAE, this might surprise you, but we're, we're growing salmon here, uh, we're cultivating salmon here. So th that movement is beginning, isn't it? Tell us about that. Because, you know, if you look at UAE, about 80% of our foods, we get it from imports. And if we continue depending on import, you don't know what is the impact of the climate change future of these countries who are producing food like in India and Pakistan. The trends indicate that there will be less rains happening in this region or more extensivity, which will have an impact on the production. And we have experienced it in the past with the onions in India, where it was very picking up the prices because India decided not to export any more onions. So I think here in UAE, the concept of the agriculture is, is changing. There is no more traditional way of agriculture has to continue in the future. And the great example which have, you have pointed about Emirates Airline, it's not only about aviation now, it's becoming uh, an innovator in, in, in agriculture where they are introducing the vertical farming, 40 million a project. You know, Emirates Catering Company produce about 230,000 meal a day for the passenger in Dubai airport. Imagine the portion of that this has to be some vegetables, which in the past have been depending heavily on import from Netherlands, uh, Australia. But with this uh, farm, they will be able to produce about uh, th almost three tons daily of vegetable fable, uh, to, to the, the passenger. Also, they will be consuming less and less water. They will be saving about 98% of the water used in, 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 in this new t for type of uh, farming. So the technology is there, the, the Ministry of Climate Change an environment, take this technology and educate the farmer how we can shift. You don't need any more land, you just need a warehouse and you can easily do the, the plantation with less consumption of water and energies. We've only got a few minutes left. I'm happy to give you the opportunity to put a, a question to our panel. Yes, there's a, there's a few people here. Okay, there's two ladies over to, to, to my left, your right. Yes, you have a microphone. If I can have your, your brief question, please. Um, hi, my name is Raham and I'm currently studying environmental science and I wanted to ask um, all of you, what are some steps students can take to be a part of effective and successful change? Um, what are some organizations that can take us in and provide us with the skills we need to help empower each other and our communities? Thank you. Fahid well, Al-Hamadi, do you want to have yeah, a stab at that one first of this one because I would like to share, of, based on the recent interviews that we do at the Ministry of Climate Change, I really noticed, especially from the students coming from university, they are very focused on what is inside the book and what is being instructed by their teacher or doctor to do in terms of I think, as you are today studying at the university, look around you in UAE or visit some entities like the Ministry of Climate Change or Dubai Municipality and understand what are the challenges that the country is experiencing or going to face, and how you can take this back to school, university, and do more research about the topic in order to come with the solutions. Because we will be depending heavily on the academy in the future, as we are, we are doing the coordination with them. This way, which will really help you and uh, support you when you, inshallah, graduate from university and go apply for a job, you can easily talk about a project that this entity experienced a challenge in the past, which will be easily uh, attracted to them. I think you have to link of what you are studying with the country challenges. I know most of these books produced in Europe or North America, but does not really serve what is the environment needed here. But you have to create the link between what you are studying and what do we have as something that we link together. We had another question from, yes, thank you, please. Yes, the lady just here who's got her hand raised just five, two meters away from you. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I want to know because, according to the water, you know, because a lot of people in UAE we are drinking water. And I want to know exactly the sodium that we will intake because I know the sodium is harmful to our body. I want to know because a lot of water, when I buy the water... To Thank the you very much. We've got your Thank question. You so the, the levels of sodium. I'm not sure anyone on the panel is necessarily qualified to answer that question specifically. Um, 
sodium quantity in water? It, it's a, a general question about the quality of water we're consuming, either desalinated or... In the UAE, we, we do have the standards for all water produced for drinking with the minimum quantity of sodium per liter. And this is why you see now even in the market there is zero, zero sodium water. I think we have to, to link this with the, with the health sector where they can make the relationship between the, the, the medical checkup or, or how the quantity of sodium absorbed in the body. I really can't give you a, the correct answer, but there is a close overlook or watch from the government on the uh, sodium level on the water that we have provided in, in, in the market. It, it's, I'm looking at this bottle here. It's 3.5 milligrams per litre. This is a Mida by water which is produced here. That's the best answer we can give you. We've got time for uh, one or two more questions, please. Yes, please. Yeah, hello, everyone. So I have a question. Besides education and all the subjects, I know they're really important, but why don't we, you know, educate our kids about farming, like, in schools, they need to know how to farm, how to take care of the environment. Another thing is I've lived in Switzerland and being aware you know, of the environment, you have to know that you're responsible for everything that you're gonna throw. You have to recycle everything, starting from leftovers to the oil you're gonna use, plastic, glass and everything. So, well, well, we know that Tim agrees with you because you made that call earlier on. Juan Carlos, as someone who's been a, a policy maker, practically speaking, what can we in, do? In Panama, it was a big debate, but we passed a law to eliminate the use of plastic bags. At the beginning, people were like, you know, complaining about it, but now everybody has to take their own bag with other material to the supermarket. It was a, a big debate about it, but we implemented it, and, and the new generations are, like you, fighting for a better future for environment, so... You just, I mean, use social media for positive things. Today, social media is a big problem. It's, it's been used to promote terrorism, hate. But if we use social media for positive things, some young kids started a campaign to support that law, and we pass it. And today in Panama, there are no plastic bags being used in any supermarket. But, but could you legislate? Could you stand on a platform of making farming a compulsory education subject, as sure. you suggested and Tim has suggested? I, I will say, in, in, in the case of my country, the, the actual president, he's trying to pass some constitutional reforms. And I will say, like, 100 law students, uh, they say, no, we want more debate. And they started going to Congress, 100 one day, 200 the next day, 1,000. And then when you see what's going on in other countries in the region, then the president say, wait, come to the palace and let's start a dialogue. So it's, it's about the new generation to empower yourself and, and fight for your belief. Maybe I can, can, I, I can yes. No, Sarah, you. please go ahead. All I want to say is that people are very dishonest <clears throat> about some of the problems in the world. We have allowed tech, that word tech, to make people feel that being a farmer is second rate. In Europe now, if you're a farmer or a gardener or horticulturist, you are regarded as the third most stupid child of the third most stupid child. As a result, there is hardly a single good agricultural college anywhere in Europe. Couple. Do you realize how dangerous that is? It is unbelievably dangerous. When you see a great farmer, you suddenly realize we could darn well feed the world. But then you see bad farmers and you realize the problem we have. It's a huge problem. Being an agronomist, which is the love child between agriculture and horticulture, is a science every bit as technical and respectable as being an engineer, a pharmacist and a doctor. And one of the big things we need to do is to make it sexy, more rock and roll, actually, you know what I mean? We do. We need young people to be going in it and going into it, and we need great role models, really great role models. And I mean, I think here in, in this country, uh, you know, the potential is enormous. I was actually wanting to ask both of you a question, which I was burning to ask. May I ask it? Okay. I come from Britain, a country of unrivaled arrogance, a country that believes it leads the world even now. But wherever I go, and you come to Dubai and you meet people from all over the world, and listening to both of you talk so elegantly and things, do you think the days of Europe leading the world have actually gone, and America, that we're watching the death throes of it and that your countries are going to be providing the leaders of the global 
uh, arena. What do you think? Or are you not allowed to say? <laughs> Could it start an incident? <laughs> but I respond to her. <laughs> I think, you see, responding back to her, I'm really having difficulties with my kids to take them to the farm. They are very well attached to their mom because she likes shopping, so she always takes them with them. But, but I think I try to change this, this concept by having small gardening in my house and do give each one of them a plant with a tag name so they can take care of their own. I think here in this region, and in, in UAE, we are taking the lead in this region of transitioning our energy, transition in our economy. And with that mix of this international nationality, we have more than 160 different nationalities in the countries where we, where, share the, we, where we share the experiences and best practices. I think we, it's not about the, the, the power, it is about how we all work together to overcome the challenges that the world is going to, to experience. Today, no matter what effort that I put here in UAE, I will not be alone able to solve the issues of the climate change. It's going to be a joint effort. It, this is why the new FCCC is there with the Paris Agreement. Regardless what Trump said, but within the U.S., there are many mayors and uh, companies within the U.S. support the Paris Agreement and uh, how to tackle the climate change. This is an issue about us. It's about our kids, about the future generation. We cannot appoint to a country. It's, I think it's appointing to all of ourselves. I think the change is going to come. This is how the ozone layer it was an issue globally. Now it has been recovered. The effort came from everyone. I have a great belief that the climate change is going to be the same where it's going to be treated. I, I will close my presentation saying that the future of politics is not about ideology. It's not about center, left, right. It's not about the government system, monarchy, democracy. It's, it's about finding the, pro the solutions to the problems that affect the people. The big debate about climate change, about poverty, about basic sanitation, housing, education, healthcare, that will be the future of politics. It won't be, no matter what country, what government, what political system, it will be about finding the problems of, that affect the new generations. Because the, the, there, will, there will be a lot of challenges for the governments, by the people asking for solutions to their problems, no matter the ideology or the, the government system. Time's up. This gentleman has been at the back has been waiting very patiently for about 10 minutes to ask a question. Tiny question and a quick response, please. So, Eli, my question is addressed to Mr. Fahd Mohammed about dealing with the, uh, climate change in light of urbanization uh, and uh, industrial development in Dubai. Do we have uh, ecological uh, restrictions of uh, legislations uh, 20, 30 years into the future? You have talked about the ecological environment. Uh, I live in an apartment. I cannot make uh, uh, a garden for my son, but you, you can do that. I think there should be a different culture in uh, art and in everything. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I will respond in, in, in English. The question I think you have translator to the questions. You tell us the question ah, as well. Okay, okay. The, the question about with the increased number of population, there would be a challenges. If you could talk into the microphone, please, Your Excellency. Okay. Ah, okay, with the increased number of the populations, what would be the the, the uh, procedure when it comes to the environment and impact assessment in a way and, and to tackle the up, upcoming uh, challenges? Similarly, he was talking about living in an apartment where he cannot do a gardening while I have done it in, in my house. I think the answer, to answer the second part of your questions, is not only within the, if you are living in an apartment or not, you can do it even outdoor. I think the government or the countries made a park or garden available or accessible to everyone where it's, the solution is not limited to plantation, but see the beauty of the nature, see the beauty of the ocean, see the beauty of everything that you've been surrounded. With regard to the number of population, the population is going to continue increasing. I have five kids. It's going to continue. So there is a, a challenge ahead of us, but the government also looking at the existing policy or law in and, and order to update it. One of them, the environmental impact assessment of any a new project. We need to understand what would be the impact and what are the measures to reduce the emission or whatever come from this industry in order to 
We'll have less harmful to the environment. We'll have to leave it there. Shukran Jazina, thank you very much indeed. Your Excellency Fahad Al Hamadi uh, to the former President of uh, Panama, His Excellency Carlos Varela, and also to Sir Tim Smith. Thank you very much indeed. I think I'm going to pass back to the uh, MCs now. I think we are going to have a quick break. What I would say is the next panel is going to be absolutely stunning. Not only have you got an awesome lineup of panelists, but you have got 100% uh, rock star moderators. So stick around for that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>